I'm going to present on one of my favourite topics today, and that's about fat. It's a, a wholly misunderstood topic. So uh, we all know the story back in 1977. These dietary guidelines were introduced into the United States. They recommended a significant reduction in overall fat consumption, as well as a specific reduction in saturated fat intake. Now, these guidelines gradually percolated down to Australia. So in 1979, they were introduced into Australia as dietary goals. And over the years, there's been numerous iterations that have resulted in our current dietary guidelines, the 2013 edition. Now, central to this introduction into Australia was a Professor Stuart Truswell. He was the Chair of Nutrition at the University of Sydney at the time, this institution here that we're at today. And in his recollection, which he recorded in a 1995 article, he uh, acknowledged that there was no background review of the medical literature at the time prior to the introduction of the Australian Dietary Goals. Now, you'll see this is a recurring theme that uh, through the iterations that they've undergone, there's never really been a substantiated effort to have a look at the science in its entirety. So to this very day, our guidelines still suggest that we limit saturated fat in the diet. Now, I struggled with this because I said, I've read the literature, and to the best of my ability, I cannot see where it says saturated fats are bad. So I said, what references were they looking at? So I went through their reference list. And all the best research that I was reading, they didn't read. And I thought, why is that? And I kept reading through them, and then buried in the appendices, I came across this statement here. Now, I won't read it out, but I'll tell you what it means. They did not look at any research pertaining to saturated fat and cholesterol during the review period. Full stop. So that explains why the Australian Dietary Guidelines and myself came to quite different conclusions about the safety of saturated fats in the diet. Now, when I had a look at the uh, current dietary guidelines, I thought, well, what research did they not look at? So I've put up three studies here. These are what's called systematic reviews or meta-analyses. In medicine, medical science, we have different tiers of evidence. And this is at the very pointy end, the top level of evidence of medical science. And from these review papers, they consolidated all the research from uh, numerous authors and they came to what they considered would be an average conclusion or a final conclusion. And the balance of evidence that was available during the period of development of our current dietary guidelines says that saturated fat in the diets is not associated with any deleterious health outcomes. That is, it's safe. So following the publication of our dietary guidelines, I thought, well, let's have a look and see what the new research is. And again, the pattern continues. The top one there is a combined meta-analysis and a systematic review from the British Medical Journal, very clearly demonstrating that saturated fats aren't associated with all-cause mortality or any of the other nasty stuff. Paper in 2016 showed the same. And again, a more recent paper from this year in 2017, saturated fats are not dangerous in the diet. At this point in time, you should be getting the message that saturated fats have no evidence of being harmful. So let's flip it on its head a little bit then and say, well, if saturated fat is safe, what about reducing the fat in our diet? Is that safe? Or, as it would seem, is that potentially harmful? So to do that, we're going to come to the most expensive medical study ever performed, 700 million US dollars. Big study, lots of dollars. So this study, the diet arm of the study, went for about eight years. They had about 50,000 participants, and on average there was about a 10% reduction in dietary fat. So if you were going to find a reduction in all-cause mortality through limiting fats in the diet, this study would demonstrate that. So what did it show? Well, here's the results table. So, the first thing to point out here is that all the results on here do not reach statistical significance. That's a fancy way of saying we can't trust them. 
the, the trends, if they show any trends, it could be statistical error. So in essence, it doesn't show anything on their results table here. But you will note that here, they talk about all participants, and they've got a column for participants without a history of heart disease. Interestingly, for a study that's looking at risk of heart disease and fat in the diet, they didn't have a column for participants with a history of cardiovascular disease. So I'm just going to pause here for a moment. I'm not going to read out that verbose comment on the left, but this was buried on page 661 of the article in the text. There's several doctors in the audience today, so can I just get a show of hands of anybody who thinks they know what that comment would actually mean? Because it seems obtuse. So it's pretty obscure. I'll tell you what it means. For those females with a history of cardiovascular disease, if they were randomised to go to the low-fat diet group, their risk of problems such as heart attacks was it increased by 26% increased. Now this was the only statistically significant finding from the whole study. Funnily enough it didn't end up in the results table but we'll just let that one go through to the keeper. So the take home from this, if you're sitting there and you're worried about saturated fats in your diet, don't. Full stop. But some of you still probably don't comprehend the connection between saturated fats and cholesterol. And I know in the clinic every day, I see patients every week and they ask me, but what about cholesterol? But what about cholesterol? We've got this uh, paradigm in our head that cholesterol is terrible. So let's have a look at what cholesterol is. You can see this here. This is a molecule on the left. Now, that's what cholesterol looks like. If I take away just one atom, it ceases to be cholesterol. So when we talk about good and bad cholesterol, it makes no more sense than if we're talking about good and bad water molecules. It just is. That's what it is. Now, cholesterol is absolutely essential. Most of it is actually made by our body, about 75% of it. So it's seen in every cell membrane. It makes up about 30% of our cell membranes. Without it, we die. It forms the basis of our steroid hormones. It forms the basis of vitamin D. It's necessary for bile acids. It really is an essential structure. Without cholesterol, we die. Now, when we're normally talking about cholesterol in common parlance, we're not meaning cholesterol. We're not talking about this. We're talking about something far more complex. We're talking about something called lipoproteins. Now, to understand what lipoproteins are, we need to understand that fat is essential for life and it has to travel around the body. But it doesn't dissolve in the blood. Fat is insoluble. So what that means is that if we just released fat into the body like that, which sometimes happens medically, you end up with what's called a fat embolism, where the fat will clump, it'll block the blood vessel, and that's bad news bear. So to get around this, we have these magnificent structures called lipoproteins. Now, you need to think about them as like submarines, where they carry their fat cargo around our circulation. So you can see on the picture here that we've got an inside cargo. It's carrying fat cholesterol, triglycerides, vitamins, antioxidants, several things. We've also got a very complex uh, outer membrane here where we've got several proteins embedded within it. Now, I want you to take note of the embedded proteins because we're going to come back to that. That is essential to understanding how they work. These are what we call the signalling molecules. Now, there's several different types of lipoproteins, and the differences are based on their size, the amount of triglycerides and cholesterol that they carry, and the type of proteins that are embedded within the walls. But the two that I want to focus on today are HDL and LDL. These are the ones that are commonly thought of as being good and bad cholesterol. But now we can think of them as being HDL as being good lipoprotein, and LDL while well, the jury's still out. So we can actually analyse LDL far more in depth than what is done on the standard blood test that's paid for by Medicare. So we generally understand that cholesterol is made up of so-called good and bad, but the blood tests I do in the clinic, I can do what's called lipid electrophoresis, and I can separate LDL out into its separate constituent parts. And not all of these are harmful. So types 1 and 2, which we call pattern A or non-oxidised, is totally benign, it's harmless. But as soon as you go into types three through seven, 
it's associated with oxidation and several other things, and that is the type of LDL cholesterol that's associated with harm. So this is what we call a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. And uh, this derived from uh, about 2,500 patients after a heart attack, and this was designed to have a look at their mortality based on whether they were the pattern A cholesterol or the pattern B cholesterol. Now, the obvious point to make here is that heart attacks are bad. After five years, most people had died. You can see the mortality here in, uh, in the group that had the pattern B was almost 90% after five years. <coughs> now, what about the group that had the pattern A, the one that we said wasn't as bad? Well, they had a significantly lower rate of death. So more than double the people after five years who had that better pattern of LDL were surviving after five years. So this certainly means something. So this is a sample of one of the tests which I've actually ordered in the clinic, so I've uh, anonymised it. And uh, this is an example of what we can actually, the kind of data and information that we get on our patients in the clinic. Now, I'd just like to point something out here. So I'm sure people have heard of the term small dense LDL, and they visualise that these are uh, these particles are massively small and they burrow into the inside of the blood vessel and that's how they do the damage. That is wrong. No such thing. That is a complete and utter misconception. They are smaller, but have a look at the size. Now, one nanometer is a millionth of a metre. Tiny. The difference in size is in the order of one or two nanometers. So it's really not a huge structural difference. And in actual fact, it just relates to what happens to that protein on the outside of it that makes that small measurement when... The, that small difference when we actually measure it. So let's have a look at what the effect of diet is on this pattern of cholesterol. So if we assume that pattern B is bad, which the data clearly suggests it is, what gives us pattern A and what gives us pattern B? So we know that if we have saturated fat, then our cholesterol goes up. Now here, you can see in this individual here, all their cholesterol, this is subsection one, subsection two, and in the area here that we don't like it so much, nothing. High LDL cholesterol, but safe LDL cholesterol in this individual. So what happens though when we have carbohydrates? Now saturated fats increase your cholesterol. Well, carbohydrates turn your cholesterol bad. So now we have LDL. There's a little bit in one and two, pattern A. Look at all this awful stuff in pattern B. Now, I could talk about uh, these other aspects of VLDL and uh, HDL, but for the purposes of not over-complicating it, we'll just ignore those for the moment. Now, let's go back and remember those different types of lipoproteins and that, how they had a unique protein embedded in their wall. Now, these three lipoproteins in the middle here, they're all essentially the same. They all have that same marker on them. So what actually happens is it begins, it leaves the liver with a load of triglycerides, starts as a VLDL, and then as it moves around the circulation, it gets rid of some stuff and swaps some stuff around, and it ends up shrinking in size. And it progresses through being an IDL to end up as a low-density lipoprotein. Same molecule, but we tend to think about them as being differently. It's just a, the same molecule on a different pathway. Now, the important thing is here, you'll see how we've labelled it with a B100. The name of the special protein that labels this uniquely is ApoB100. Funny name, you don't need to understand what it means, just remember that's a unique signal. Now, that signal allows this bit of cholesterol, uh, this LDL particle, to be taken up by the liver and removes it from the circulation. It's a docking signal. Now, what happens if we damage that docking signal? And we can. We do it all the time with sugar. You've just seen a presentation where this concept of advanced glycosylated end products was presented. Now, that same thing happens to the protein on the outside of this lipoprotein particle. So this uh, black strand here represents protein strands. Then we have sugar that attaches to it. And that defunctions it. That ends up progressing to, again, what we call advanced glycosylated end product. So what happens now? We've got this particle going through our circulation, comes to the liver, and the liver says, I don't know who you are. There's nowhere to go. So the only other alternate pathway is this one we see down the bottom involving something we call a macrophage, 
within a blood vessel. And we'll come back to that later, but that's essential to know. Well, let's take a closer look now. So this picture on the top right is a demonstration of a macrophage. You can think of them as little Pac-Men. They just engulf whatever it is that's not there, not meant to be there. They've got special receptors called scavenger receptors. Now, the damaged ApoB100 is not recognised by the liver, but it is recognised by these scavenger receptors on the macrophages inside the wall of the blood vessel. So this is basically part of the process of what we call atherosclerosis. Let's look at it another way. The bus. It represents an LDL, and clearly we can see where it's going, heading straight to the liver. Now, if we disturb the signal, then remember, there's only one of these on each molecule. There's only one signal there, because there's no backups here. Then it doesn't know where it's going. It's just going to drive around aimlessly until finally <laughs> it ends up on the scrap heap. This is what LDL does. If we damage this signal molecule, it doesn't get taken up by the liver. It ends up gunking up the inside of your blood vessels. Now, this is a, uh, this is a process. This is well versed in science. Now, other side note, there's researchers from Nagoya in Japan have actually found that what reduces the size of these particles from pattern A to pattern B is actually the glycation. They've found that uh, there's a very, very strong association. Now, if we come back to the role of glycation or sugar damage in this, we can see supporting research here demonstrating that for the same level of LDL cholesterol, increasing our blood glucose levels associate higher risk of heart disease. So this front column here, this is low level of glucose, and this is your risk of uh, heart attack or myocardial infarction. For the same amount of LDL in your circulation, you can see that the risk goes up, up, up in each of these columns, both for males and females. The increased sugar is actually what's associated with the damage. Now, having a look at it another way, just from the last talk, you're all aware that insulin resistance is associated with high blood sugar levels. So this is what happens when we, uh, when we map it out with insulin. We see insulin level, very low risk. There's very little difference in your risk of heart attack if you have high levels of LDL if your insulin is controlled. What happens if your insulin level goes up? Skyrockets. So you can have high LDL but it's only when it becomes glycated and damaged from the sugar, which we get from carbohydrates, that the damage is done. So this leads us to an understanding of how low-carbohydrate diets can improve our LDL cholesterol. Now, many people don't realise, I'm sure everybody here does, but out there in the big wide world, they don't realise that complex carbs are chains of glucose molecules. And when you digest them, they enter the bloodstream. And then we know what happens. Then they're exposed to these other products. We can have this glycation, and then we end up with oxidised LDL. So that's why in the clinics, when I'm seeing patients, I frequently see, I do this test on the patients, a transition from a pattern B LDL to a pattern A LDL after treating them with a low carbohydrate diet. Now, let's take a brief detour because I know I'm going to get asked questions on this later, statins. People think statins prevent dying. But the better way to think about it is that they might not prevent dying, but they just delay dying because we know it's going to happen eventually. <laughs> so this paper set out to answer the question, how long does, do statins delay mortality? So they had 11 studies, over 90,000 participants, and they were followed for about four and a half years. So here's the question. If you took a statin for four and a half years and you had a history of heart disease, this is the group most likely to benefit, how long do you think your lifespan would be increased by? So I want everybody to just answer to yourself. Here's the answer, according to this study. <laughs> now what happens if you don't have a history of heart disease? So this was published in the British Medical Journal a couple of years ago, not a bad little journal. Very interesting reading. Now, uh, for the final part of the talk here, I'd like to focus on a particular interest area of mine, and that's to do with vegetable oils and fish oils. Now, 
if I do my job, everybody in the audience here will be able to answer this question. What is the nexus between aspirin and vegetable oil? I'm hoping that uh, a few people might already have a bit of an idea. So we're going to focus on two types of polyunsaturated fats called omega-3 and omega-6 fats. Now, these fats are absolutely essential for life. They can't be manufactured in the body. Every one of these omegas that we get has to be ingested. Now, they're both essential. So while we're going to talk about improving your ratio today, we're not aiming to absolutely eliminate omega-6 from the diet, which, by the way, is pretty much impossible. For if you did that, then you'd have some serious consequences. They're both essential, but they need to be present in balance. So to understand this, I'm going to introduce you to something that you probably, the doctors will remember from biochemistry, and the rest of you probably will never have heard. It's eicosanoids. These are basically local hormones. They only act on cells close to the site where they're produced. And they regulate several important things, including inflammation and swelling, fever, clotting, and the immune system. Very important little uh, chemicals. Now, of relevance, they're only made from omega-3 or omega-6 fats. Now, this omega-3 or omega-6 fats, so with the, uh, the three on top here and a six on the bottom here, they're actually stored in this fat layer that surrounds the outside of the cells. And so when the body wants to make one of these eicosanoid products, it reaches up into the cell membrane and grabs out one of these fats and uses it to make the product. So let's have a look at this process in a little more detail. So on the left, if the cell grabs an omega-6, we can see what happens. It ends up going down through this process and produces something called arachidonic acid. Now, let's have a wee closer look at this side. Now, once we're with arachidonic acid, you can see with the action of these other enzymes here, arachidonic acid can be converted into substances which are very, very inflammatory. In actual fact, we frequently use medications to target these enzymes to reduce the production of these chemicals. We know how inflammatory they are. So the middle one there, the series two prostaglandins, something like prostaglandin E2, we specifically target that with anti-inflammatory medication. Now, if we come back and have a look at the other side of the coin, if the cell grabs an omega-3, that ends up producing something that we call EPA and DHA. Basically, these are what's found in fish oil. And the products that we have from conversion of these are not that inflammatory, very much less inflammatory than on the other side. So if we come back to the whole process, these two pathways are inextricably linked. So it depends on which one they're grabbing from the cell membrane. But the processing of it depends on these enzymes. I've only included two of them. But both these delta desaturase enzymes are shared by both pathways. So what that means is that if we, and they compete for these enzymes, if we increase the amount of omega-6s, then we reduce the ability of the omega-3 side to convert to the more active forms. And we can see this here in this plot here. And you can clearly see this is a plot of omega-6 in purple and omega-3 in green. Increasing levels of one will lead to a reduction in the amount of the other. So clearly, if we're trying to optimise our ratio, it's, if we want more omega-3, it's not just enough to pump in the omega-3. We should also follow this up with a correlated reduction in our omega-6. So assuming we can do this, let's have a look at what it might mean practically. So remember fats that are found in all our cell membranes? Our red blood cells are cells, yeah? So we can assess this ratio in our red blood cells from a simple blood test. So these graphs represent prospective data that was published in two very good journals, the Journal of the American Medical Association and the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, the risk of heart attack is depicted by the vertical bars going up. And increasing amounts of omega-3 in the cell membrane are shown along the bottom here. So what we can see is that the highest level of omega-3 in both of these studies, so 6.3% here, 7.3% here, was associated with 10 times less risk of dying from a heart attack than the people with the lowest level of omega-3 in their cell membranes. If there was one blood test that you would do, maybe besides insulin, to assess your risk of dying from a heart attack, this is what I would do. 
And this is what we do do in our clinic. Let's look at it another way. If you had less than 4% omega-3 in your cell membranes, and most of my patients, when they come in, do, if we were able to increase you to this range of 4 to 8%, that would lead to a 42% risk reduction in having a heart attack. And if we were able to put you over 8%, 69% reduce risk of having a heart attack. And this is what we try and do when we optimise your fat intake. So this graph here just demonstrates a, a spread of omega-3s in the population. And we can clearly see that the people are sort of 2 or 3%, 3 or 4%, they vastly outnumber the people who are over 8% where we really want people to be. Now, this is an actual patient result. So this gentleman here, you can see he was already on a low-carb diet when we did this test, but then we've started focusing on the fats and oils. So you can see he started out with a really good omega-3 level to begin with, 8.9. He's, he's in that low-risk group already. And yet, over the course of about 12 months, we were still able to get a massive, massive improvement. This puts him in rarefied air. This is good. Off the charts. So how did he do it? Well, he reduced the sources of fats in the diet with excess levels of omega-6, and he increased his intake of omega-3. So what you can see here in blue, this is demonstrating the amount of omega-6 in some common fats. So you see at the top, things that we usually like, coconut oil and butter, not much omega-6 there, right? It would be easy to offset that with a fish oil supplement. What about some of these seed oils down here? Let's have a closer look at the ratio of omega-6 and omega-3 in some vegetable and seed oils. Out of this world. So if you were worried about those inflammatory products of the omega-6 side of the eicosanoid pathway, you're probably not going to be having this healthy grapeseed oil, which I drive every time I go to the airport, I see this wonderful billboard saying the most healthy grapeseed oil. Well, it's not hard to be a little bit healthier than that. But it's also important to take a, a look at the rest of our food supply. This graph here demonstrates a level of omega-3 seen in grass-fed beef on the left. We see it's about 3% here. What happens when we start to grain feed them? What happens after 196 days of grain feeding? Previously healthy beef with a very good amount of omega-3. You don't just need to eat your fish to get omega-3. Grass-fed beef will do fine. Zero. And interestingly, if we have a look at farm salmon, we see something similar, not to the same extent, but uh, there was one study that demonstrated that farm salmon had about 17% less omega-3 oils than wild-caught salmon. Now, I'm not going to get into a debate about ethics on that. It's interesting to note, though, that the farm salmon, as well as having all the algae, they are often fed a lot of pellets. So uh, thank you for your time. Uh, the questions will come later.